Test. Test, test, test. Thank you very much. Good morning, good morning everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, in the room with you today, um, especially people we have been working on this for so long. Um, and now we are able to share um, the room. Uh, my name is Elias Yatitsa. I am a member of Privacy International, a London-based organization uh, that works globally with partners to challenge government and corporate uh, data and technology exploitation. Um, and uh, we are here to, today to, discu to discuss um, human rights centered technology in emergency responses. In the aftermath, of the, the aftermath of the pandemic found more than half of the world's countries enacting emergency measures in response to COVID-19 pandemic. These measures included the rapid introduction and repurposing of surveillance measures and technologies to fight the COVID-19 pandemic that has downstream impacts on human rights, fundamental freedoms, and the rule of law. Nearly three years after the start of the pandemic, now is the time to take stock, assess the legality, necessity, and proportionality of the surveillance measures and technologies introduced to fight the pandemic and determine what lessons have been learned so that governments and civil society and the entire world are better prepared for the next global emergency. Also, we need to make sure that these measures and practices should not be normalized and remain with us uh, as uh, considering the effect they have, they had and continue to be having on our freedoms. In a joint initiative by ECNL, INCLO, and PI, with support of partner organizations, including INCLO members, that they are here with us in the room, um, and uh, with, with whom we will talk more uh, as during the discussion, um, we uh, have been conducting an in-depth research on these surveillance measures and identified globally observed trends about the harms of the COVID-19 surveillance measures on civil society and beyond that we plan to present in an upcoming report that we hope to release uh, sometime mid-December. Today, we would like to share some of these findings with you and we're hoping to make today's workshop a dialogue with all of you 
uh, that will reform the, inform the upcoming report. In the next uh, few minutes, my uh, fellow panelists will provide an overview of our findings and recommendations. And then we would like to open the floor to hear your thoughts and opinions and experiences and gaps. And more generally, on what should happen in the future. Uh, let me briefly present. Um, Olga Kronin uh, is the project manager in the area of surveillance and human rights in the 15-member International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations, INCLO. She's based in Dublin, Ireland, uh, where she's also a policy officer in the same area at the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. Karolina Ivanska is the Digital Civic Space Advisor at the European Centre for Not-for-Profit Law, ECNL, uh, working on the impacts of technology on civil freedoms and con coordinating ECNL's advocacy on EU level, notably uh, the EU AI Act. So, Olga, can you give us uh, an overview of the findings? Thanks, Ilya, and thanks, Ilya, and thanks everyone who has made it here this morning. Um, we've been looking forward to having this conversation and get any, any feedback or insights that you might want to share on our, on our work. Um, and our uh, researchers are here today with us, as Ilya said, and um, they'll get to introduce themselves when, when, we, when we chat. Um, so basically, Ilya has given a case of, or given an overview of the why we've done this project. Um, and I'll, what I'll do is just give an uh, overview of the how and the what. So basically, um, as Ilya explained, ECNL, PI and INCLO, in collaboration with um, Nina uh, Top Jaganera of Stanford University, first did some desktop research of just to see what kind of measures were out there and what surveillance measures were taken in response to COVID-19. Um, and then after that, uh, INCLO, as Ilias mentioned, is a 15-member um, network um, of civil liberties organisations around the world. And we surveyed all our members about their COVID measures and rules and laws that were, in, uh, that were um, in, put in place. Um, out of those surveys, we felt that there were several jurisdictions worthy of deeper um, examination. So we asked our colleagues, De Justicia in Colombia, Contrast in Indonesia, the Kenyan Human Rights Commission in Kenya and the Legal Resources Centre in South Africa to carry out that deeper work. And um, we further asked um, our research partners, La Quadrature du Net, excuse my French, in France, and um, independent researcher Amber Sina um, in India to do that same deeper work in those jurisdictions. So that brought to six the number of jurisdictional kind of case studies that we had. Then we used those case studies to um, as the basis for our report. And when we looked further into all of those case studies, we basically identified five key trends. Um, and those five key trends kind of brings us to our what, our findings. So those five key trends were First of all, the repurposing of existing security measures, um, silencing of civil society, the risk of abuse of personal data, um, the influential role of private companies, and the normalisation of surveillance beyond the pandemic. Um, in terms of the first trend, the repurposing of existing security measures, in response to COVID-19, some governments took advantage of the existing frameworks and resources that had originally been introduced for counter-terrorism measures. Um, these moves included drawing upon existing legislation and um, de the deployment of military technologies and the use of national intelligence services. Um, we saw in Israel the, the use of the Shin Bet um, intelligence services to retrace the movements of people who had tested positive for COVID so that they could um, identify people who they had been in contact with. Um, and they did this by basically tapping into a previously undisclosed trove of personal data um, or cell phone data that had been gathered um, by the Shinbet for countering terrorism. We also saw in Kenya, which hopefully Martin Manvangina would be able to talk to, talk to um, in a few minutes, um, where the Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act 2018 was used by the state to punish bloggers and um, voices of dissent for allegedly publishing misleading information. Um, we also saw similar um, similar actions but in Indonesia through the use of, the, of Indonesia's law and information and electronic transactions, but also the creation of a virtual police unit, which was basically formed to preempt and prevent potential cybercrime. Um, so in a nutshell, like for more than a decade, human rights defenders have been um, documenting how counterterrorism laws operate with little transparency um, and accountability. 
you know, to kind of quash dissent and silence critics. And the same concerns apply when counterterrorism measures are used to, um, in a pandemic response. In terms of the second trend, um, the silencing of civil society, um, and similar to the repurposing of cybercrime laws, um, some countries such as the Philippines, Russia, South Africa introduced legislation to criminalise pandemic related misinformation. Um, and when combined with disproportionate penalties, up to six years in jail in, in the case of Argentina um, and unclear criteria to define what qualifies as misinformation. These measures, measures rather contributed to a climate of fear and intimidation. Um, and then couple that with states deploying um, or introducing technologies such as drones, robots, facial recognition under the justification of enforcing mandatory lockdowns um, and the increasing of um, surveillance of public spaces, um, this posed a threat to, to freedom of assembly. Um, and bear in mind, these technologies were used at a time when protest, uh, sorry, the, the, these technologies were used to survey public, pla public spaces at a time when protests were clearly being being closely monitored, if not, you know, outlawed, um, and where people were for forcibly dispersed, in some cases violently. Um, in the case of the third trend, the risk of abuse of personal data, um, governments were introducing, as you know, tools you know, designed to trace the spread of the virus, but this involved the collection of massive amounts of personal data, in some cases health data, very highly sensitive data. Um, and in some jurisdictions, these were created with little public consultation or oversight. Um, we, at least in our research, we just determined that many of the contact tracing apps were rolled out with little, um, um, as I said, public consultation, but also um, they did not meet the fundamental data, uh, fundamental principles of data protection in terms of legality, necessity, proportionality and data minimization. Um, so, for example, in Colombia, in the Constitutional Court of Colombia, which Daniel Ospina from De Justicia will speak to, um, hopefully, um, they determined that the data collection connected to the mandatory use of the app was unlawful. Um, so, going on then to the fourth trend, which was the influential role of private companies, we saw um, private companies playing a significant role in the pandemic by either cooperating with governments to develop apps and tools or engaging in data sharing arrangements. In countries like Colombia and the UK, um, governments entered into these public-private partnerships that were very opaque, um, these agreements. Um, and like in some cases, the entire scope wouldn't have been re revealed rather until activists demanded transparency. Um, so this lack of transparency makes it very difficult for civil society to understand the extent of data sharing between governments and private companies and also where it stands now and where it's going in the future. Um, probably um, we saw, for example, we saw in South Africa the use of WhatsApp, which Cheryl Das from the Legal Resources Centre will hopefully speak to. Um, and uh, we also, probably one of the most impactful um, interventions from the private sector was the use of the Google Apple Exposure Notification um, Application Program Interface API. This is the Bluetooth Gain API, um, which was used in nearly 40 countries. Um, and that served as the basic you know, building block to, for governments to build their own contact tracing apps. But I mean, it, the countries who sought to build their own app um, were stimmied by the fact that Google and Apple's operating systems restricted the black background Bluetooth broadcasting, which would lower the efficacy of any other app. So the popularity of that um, does raise, uh, raised and still raises significant concerns about the power of private corporations to determine emergency responses. Um, and then the fifth one, sorry, I know I'm probably going on too long, but the fifth one is the normalization of surveillance beyond the pandemic. Um, and from our research, we're concerned that the pandemic has provided an entry point for invasive government surveillance to become normalized, even after the threat of the virus has receded. So we observed um, the continuation and normalization of state surveillance in some jurisdictions. As previously stated, you know, our report describes how states repurposed counterterrorism laws and technologies and applied them to civilians in the name of fighting COVID-19. But we must also be very wary of the opposite phenomena, the normalization and repurposing of these measures and tools. Um, and we have good reason to fear the possibility of mission creep because we've already seen governments um, announce their intention to use data collected during the pandemic for secondary purposes, such as the development of national health programs or, um, or platforms in Colombia, in India, which hopefully Amber will maybe speak to, and, um, and South Africa. So um, on the surface, 
you know, this shift from COVID-19 to general public health may appear unproblematic, but the use of data originally collected in exceptional circumstances for specific purposes um, violates the purpose of, of purpose limitation and contributes to the normalization of a surveillance that state um, of a surveillance state that accumulates large amounts of data um, about incidents that could be disproportionate and, intru and intrusive. So um, after that overview, I hope I wasn't too long, but I'll pass you over to Carolina for our, the recommendations that followed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, yes, so based on that research and on the cases that we identified, we came up with some recommendations for three groups of actors that we see as relevant um, uh, and, and to, to act in this in this space so that we have a better human rights center technology in, in, in next emergencies that are inevitably there to come. And the three actors are obviously the state actors, private sector and civil society, and these bubbles, you know, they, they are <laughs> increasingly smaller because we see the most recommend, most responsibilities obviously lie on the shoulder of the states. Um, and so let me start with those. Just a couple of keywords and we have very detailed recommendations actually in the report and we also hope to discuss with you. Um, but essentially the biggest problem, and as Olga mentioned, um, that we saw a general trend of lack of reflection and lack of assessment of human rights impacts of these technologies prior to their deployment. You know, that can obviously be explained by the emergency uh, that was happening. There was little time, but there was indeed a lot of hasty and opaque um, the, the technologies were deployed in a hasty and opaque way, and we see a, an important need for review to take stock uh, three years on, review the surveillance measures and technologies that were deployed during the pandemic, um, and assess them in the context of human rights compliance, in the context of their impact on human rights, um, also in the context of their efficacy, um, uh, in order to check which um, which technologies um, uh, were uh, you know, were, were, were good and which ones are, should be seized because they have been, they're incompliant with human rights or they are no longer necessary. Similarly, any data that was collected that is no longer necessary or any apps that were implemented but are no longer used or necessary should be seized. Um, another uh, thing that we saw was that also from our researchers on the ground, it was very difficult to gather information about the status of these tools, about the, how they operate, about um, even legal basis that on which they rely. So we see a need for improvement in terms of transparency and pro providing public information already now about the tools that were deployed during the pandemic, um, whether what is their status, whether they are st still in use, um, the, the results of those impact assessments. I see I'm, con sorry, I'm constantly disconnecting from Zoom because the internet is a bit shaky so we have to be sure um, uh, no 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 it will connect to Zoom in a, in a couple of minutes because the internet is really weak yeah, yeah. so so you, you keep on losing the presentation but um, let me then am I connected again yeah yeah I can Sorry for, yeah, okay. No, no, because you don't have it. So I have to do it. Sorry for the little technical break. <laughs> we need to sort things out. This should work now, but I will continue in the meantime. Um, so, yeah, we essentially see the need to uh, uh, to share way more information that was shared before on the status of these, these technologies, on their human rights uh, assessment. Um, and then also the same should be done actually with legal frameworks, with laws and policies that were applied during the pandemic, with state of emergencies that were uh, introduced and maybe never revoked. So... Um, so, uh, so we see the need also to revise that. Um, and now in terms of 
future emergencies. So these were the recommendations when, when we are dealing still with the COVID-19 pandemic, so to reassess actually the response that the states uh, did. And then for the future, we inevitably will have future health or other emergencies. Uh, so in order to be for the states to be prepared, they should uh, revise or develop legal frameworks that are in line with international human rights standards based on the lessons learned and the problems identified. Um, and they, these legislation should have key elements such as you know sunset clauses for the technologies that are used so that they are not repurposed for other reasons data protection rules if they are not in place already um, and also uh, meaningful public participation you know in many cases we saw that civil society or or uh, you know, people in general, they were not really uh, involved in the creation of these tools or in the discussions. We did identify some good practices and we highlight them in the report, but in general, the governments did not uh, uh, ensure meaningful public participation, which we see as crucial actually to also assessing potential uh, impacts of these technologies. And then we also would uh, recommend governments, uh, and now we can later talk about how to achieve that, not to use these surveillance measures as a pretext to stifle dissent, to uh, to repurpose them for other reasons after, after the emergency. Yes, uh, previous one. Yes. Um, and uh, and also, as Olga mentioned, we, see, we saw the increased role of private companies and also the use of data that were collected for the purposes of the pandemic for commercial purposes. So we also see the need to ensure that that doesn't happen in the future. Um, and then finally, a, a maybe more detailed uh, um, recommendation is that is to introduce a prohibition of indiscriminate biometric surveillance because we also see these in very intrusive technologies being used during the pandemic to stifle dissent in the, under the, the guise of, of fighting um, uh, COVID. And now in terms of, com for, for companies, obviously they have you know, we, we, we called it in the report that this is the first pandemic or emergency in the smartphone era. And obviously the, the companies, they had an, a huge role in responding to, to, um, to the pandemic. So we also see the need for improvement in terms of transparency, in terms of um, keeping them to account on uh, what uh, sort of responses companies also facilitate. So we also see internally the need for assessment of human rights compliance in line with UN uh, getting principles on business and human rights, but also in line of I laws existing in specific jurisdictions. And again, to seize any practices or, techno or technologies that are not compliant with these standards. Um, internally, companies should also have human rights policies that are there for the future when they uh, also uh, introduce um, surveillance technologies or help governments in, in responses to emergencies, including very importantly procedures for assessing government's access to data because we saw a lot of um, kind of data sharing agreements between governments and, pr and private companies. Um, and these policies should, to the extent possible, uh, make sure to, to th that these exchanges happen in line with, with human rights standards. Of course, data protection uh, in terms of how uh, people's personal data is processed by these technologies is, is, is an important matter as well. Um, and uh, give, giving the public more information about the sort of agreements, data sharing agreements that are in place as well, and ensuring access to remedies when the company's actions have caused or contributed to adverse impacts. And finally, last but not least, we see a very important role for civil society. We also highlight uh, in our report a couple of successful advocacy or litigation um, actions that civil society took to actually challenge um, surveillance measures that were in compliance with human rights, for example, drones in France. Um, also, we hear from our colleague from Colombia, another uh, interesting case. So we see really the role for civil society to act as a watchdog in these uh, circumstances. Of, co of course, it's not easy because it requires time, effort, and anybody here from civil society knows that, you know, we had to drop everything and move to, move to 
watching essentially what the state does, but this is really important to monitor and investigate um, these measures and pursue any avenues, be it you know, public pressure, legal avenues to uh, challenge measures which violate human rights, uh, as well as urge governments not to repurpose surveillance measures after the pandemic is finished. So now it's also a crucial moment for civil society to step in uh, and demand transparency from state agencies on the tools used, their purposes, private uh, public uh, partnerships and agreements, um, as well as laws that should be developed. Uh, and, you know, civil society should demand the seat at the table because their view is really important in this context. And as well, of course, apply pressure to companies. And these are very high level and we hope that we uh, get to discuss a bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, we heard from Olga about uh, the very concerning trends that uh, have been identified and these are only a few uh, in the course of the pandemic and as um, uh, shown already by the recommendations we have for states, companies, the civil society, there is lots to be done and lots to continue to be done and I know that we all know this the world doesn't stop moving uh, but uh, we need to remain vigilant to ensure that abuses that happened uh, in the past uh, three years uh, do not occur again with the next global uh, emergency. Uh, so uh, our aim of the rest of the session today was more to have a conversation with you. Uh, we don't want questions to ask, we have more questions towards uh, you. We would like to pick your brains about these findings and recommendations and to ensure that uh, our report is robust and use, as useful as possible. So we welcome feedback, uh, questions, insights, um, uh, anything you uh, can offer uh, to bring to the table. Um, so with that, uh, I open the conversation to, to you. Um, I don't know if you already have some thoughts on what was already presented or want to add to it. I know it's early in the morning. Is uh, anyone uh, from online that would... Uh, there's no internet, so I... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay. Do you see maybe if there are comments? Um, let, let's, let's start. Let, let me uh, tease the room a bit. Um, we had a recommendation for civil society to focus on the need of uh, uh, civil society organization to monitor, investigate, intervene against state and corporate responses when needed. Our research details litigation in France against drones use, uh, Israel mass surveillance by intelligence services, and Colombia the, against unnecessary data collection. Uh, are there any other similar examples uh, one could think of successful uh, advocacy or litigation efforts, good practices from civil society uh, that we could be using now in the future to challenge some of these practices? Hi. Um, hi, thank you. My name is Daniel. I am a researcher from the Justicia uh, Civil Society in organization in Colombia. And um, I might develop a bit on Ilya's question and in the Colombia on the Colombian case. Um, as our panelists were saying, in Colombia we had a very interesting strategic litigation um, that a civil society organization undertook with the help of some um, journalists because uh, in Colombia as in many other countries there was the government deployed this contact tracing app that was called Corona app and it received a lot of criticism because of its lack of transparency and primarily accountability. Although the official narrative said that the app was voluntary, in practice it became almost quasi-mandatory. And uh, as many other contact tracing apps, it um, it asked you to report your information on location, on the symptoms you had, on who you live with, on who's your family, on your friends, even where you work, and. Um, 
when this app became quasi mandatory, civil society was we were very concerned, especially because uh, the airport authorities requested the app to be downloaded and uh, and the survey completed to enter the airport. Um, this this case, this litigation started because there is a very famous journalist in Colombia that has been persecuted by the state and she wanted to travel to another city to from Bogota to another city in Colombia to talk with one of her um, sources and she refused to download the app and to um, kind of complete the survey that the app requested. She was denied the entrance to the airport and she could not fly it and get uh, and work with the source that she was working with. Um, so she started this litigation with the help of Fundacion Carisma, that is another civil society organization, and with other three citizens, including one congresswoman, um, asking the government, the judges, to protect the rights, the fundamental rights, I mean, to privacy and data protection and freedom of movement that were clearly violated by the airport. And uh, the case was a very interesting case because it, uh, at first, judges didn't understood it, understand it. They just dismissed the case. And finally, the Constitutional Court of Colombia reviewed the case. However, this revision came almost a year and a half later when this mandatory use of Corona app was no longer in force. So the first uh, ruling of the Constitutional Court was there is no longer danger so I, I must dismiss this case. But although that might be the general ruling, the, the ruling did have um, very interesting considerations on data protection because although it says that it said that as it wasn't mandatory by the time the ruling came, the government was obliged to respect privacy and data protection in states of emergency and the Constitutional Court deemed that what the government had done and what the airport had done was unconstitutional, was unlawful, and it violated uh, the f fundamental right to privacy of not only of the journalist and the congresswoman that presented the case, but of everyone that was obligated to download the app to get uh, to enter the airport. As a result, the Constitutional Court ordered uh, the Ministry of Health and the uh, National Digital Agency that were the entities in charge of Corona app to erase the plaintiff's data. And it also ordered uh, them to create a special mechanism for everyone that wants his or her data to be erased, they could access those that mechanism. We were expecting the Constitutional Court to uh, order the erasal of all data, but the creation of this mechanism is still very interesting, and we believe that it is a successful story, even though even though it have it has its downsides. It is a successful litigation that um, expands the right to privacy in Colombia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's it's. Uh, it's not only a success story, but uh, also you reflected on the lesson learned and things that could be done beyond uh, uh, the ruling and moving forward. But uh, how is the situation uh, with the app now in Colombia? Is it still operational? Do you have any information from the government with regard to uh, the use of the data that was collected from it? Um. Currently, the app disappeared as Corona app, but it was repurposed to a general app from the uh, Ministry of Health. That is, uh, it's called Min Salud Digital, that in English would be something like uh, Min Health uh, Digital. Um, this repurposing not only was kind of a report post there is lack of information on how it became report post and i think that in many other countries this might be the same situation 
No, I, it, I was, I, it was a trick question, I promise, but it was hinting exactly on the other trend that was mentioned by Olga about the increasing collaboration, partnership, dependency to private companies to deliver some of the um, two measures that were introduced. And the lack of transparency quite often with regard to the conditions for these collaborations from what access uh, uh, the companies had to the data, how the, um, uh, how the uh, tools will be used or repurposed, uh, lack of any information with regard to the transparency around their use. Um, and in that regard, uh, uh, Colombia hasn't been the only case that we've seen that. But we have also seen, um, we've seen it in many other countries across the globe. And with that, maybe I, I could invite uh, Cheryl to give her, um, her thoughts of what has happened in that regard in South Africa. And again, please also introduce yourself. Thank you, Ilya. Um, I'm Sherelle Das. I'm an attorney from the Legal Resources Center in South Africa. And we've participated as in, in researching the case, South African case study. Um, yeah, so the primary technologies that the South African government introduced to control the spread of the COVID-19 virus was two apps, which is the COVID Connect app as well as the COVID Alert app. So at the very beginning, um, the COVID Connect app began as a WhatsApp platform. And later on, it expanded to uh, become more of a service provided by the health for, provided for healthcare information, screening, and contact tracing. And the COVID Alert app was launched alongside the COVID Connect app. And you know, as Olga mentioned, um, it was built on the GAIN API and works via Bluetooth. Um, so a lot of private companies were involved in some instances of data collection and processing. Um, Discovery is a major medical aid service provider in South Africa. They developed the software um, and it's supposed to be on behalf of the Depart National Department of Health, uh, but they continue to provide the technical support services to the department. Um, and uh, besides Discovery, the largest telecommunications company was also involved in providing technical expertise to the South African government. So the most concerning aspect of the COVID-19 apps is their reliance on WhatsApp um, as a communication platform. Um, so independent technical reviewers explained that the use of the WhatsApp API to notify COVID um, alert SA app users of the results of their COVID tests raised privacy concerns, um, regardless of how you know, reliable or convenient that system might be. So this approach would allow third parties with commercial interests to identify which users uh, had been diagnosed with, uh, as COVID-19 positive. Um, and this wasn't a requirement of the GAIN framework, so the technical advisors believe that this was just a preference or a choice made by the developers of the app. Um, and although the content of the messages are encrypted, there were serious concerns around how that information will be processed um, when a person engages with the app um, around their, their COVID-19 status. So the technical ref uh, you know, review has also raised two uh, concerns, which I think was important in the South African case, case study. And the first was the app source code. Uh, which was obfuscated and has not been made publicly available. And this really refers to around the transparency uh, um, that private companies um, are, are not providing uh, information uh, to the public. Um, and this is frustrated efforts to understand the, copes of, uh, the scope of the app's processing activities. So the technical impediment also complicates the analysis of the app by independent technical reviewers and again, touches on the transparency criteria. And the second is that the technical reviewers detected a suspicious URL, uh, which potentially sends you know, very sensitive information like dates of birth, cell phone numbers, names and surnames to backend servers. And they were concerned that if this is confirmed, it would be contrary to privacy uh, claims reflected in the Google Apps uh, app description. Um, so those were the two major concerns um, raised in South Africa from our research. 
Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I, uh, so in that regard, I would like to invite if anybody else would have uh, any other inputs or questions in relation to what was shared uh, right now or uh, before. Peter, and please introduce uh, yourself as well. Thanks. I'm Peter Meisek from Access Now, and uh, I think this is a super important topic. Um, Access Now is a global digital rights organization. Uh, we found that um, what happens, what starts during crises can often continue for, for a very long time. These crises don't um, usually just end with a, with a clear, um, you know, bang. Uh, they, they, they continue and long beyond when the headlines and the media are reporting on them. And so um, with things like internet shutdowns lasting, you know, more than two years in Ethiopia, um, a long time in Myanmar and other countries, um, what seem like emergency measures can really become permanent. And that's why it's it's uh, so important to put human rights at the center. And um, for, for our part, we just launched here at IGF on Tuesday um, a report, a declaration on principles for social media companies on how to better govern content in a rights, human rights respecting way um, during, before, during, and after crisis situations. And um, I think that the role of, of those big platforms is, um, is one piece of that technology puzzle um, that it's important to draw out because um, there is content that can incite violence um, and uh, campaigns of disinformation that exacerbate crises. Uh, and those, those social media companies do have responsibilities. Um, uh, we're also uh, looking at the role that the UN plays and other big um, governments and big multilateral organizations who procure and buy a lot of these um, tools from third party vendors, from private sector companies, and uh, are relying on the private sector to, you know, digitally transform their services. And uh, there's already been a number of examples where um, big organizations like the HCR, High Commissioner for Refugees, contract with small companies that um, uh, sell biometric surveillance tools like iris scanning. And uh, these iris scanning um, scanners are actually uh, required if you want to, as a refugee, um, procure you know food and and um, basic essential goods and services and so their data their sensitive data is being processed without any consent without any meaningful legal basis and uh, this shows I think the, the important role for uh, human rights in the screening processes and procurement um, protocols of of big governments and um, you know big clients like that who who I hope um, can you know uh, use their you know their power and their buying power to um, raise the standards and uh, you know reflect what the human rights system um, tells us about uh, the need for uh, the ways that these technologies can impact human rights no thank you thank you very much these are absolutely uh, crucial points and then uh, very uh, important to hear about this declaration calling specifically on social media companies as key actors in how we'll address uh, this and future crisis. And uh, we heard a lot about companies, but uh, let's bring back to the states, the primary holders of human rights obligations. And uh, in that regard, uh, maybe it would be interesting also to hear about lessons learned from India on what has happened with uh, regard to uh, the measures that were taken there. Uh, Amber, maybe. Thanks, uh, thanks, Celia. I think the uh, in India, uh, there have been a variety of measures uh, in order to respond to the pandemic. Uh, and apart from, I think, some of the measures such as lockdowns and curfews, uh, which were largely short-lived in most parts of the world, aside from maybe a handful of countries who chose to pursue a zero COVID strategy. A lot of focus in terms of pandemic response was down to data and tech measures. And to begin with, uh, I think the most uh, 
downloaded contact tracing software in the world is the Ar Arogi Setu software, uh, contact tracing app in India. And from the very beginning, the whole thing was, was mired in a lot of mystery. So there is the National Informatics uh, Center in India, which supposedly developed the app. And uh, over a period of the first few weeks, there was lack of clarity about actually who built the app. So uh, the NIC is registered as the developer of the app if you go on the Play Store. Uh, the, there was also news reports which stated that there was uh, some form of uh, you know volunteerism in terms of a set of uh, industry individuals coming together and building the app. And in fact, uh, when RTI applications were sent to the government to inquire about the exact process followed uh, to commission uh, the building of the app, there was no clear response. In fact, at one point, the response said that the government did not know who had built the app, uh, which was quite bizarre, to say the least. Uh, there was immediate pushback from the civil society uh, uh, in terms of some of the measures of the app. So uh, just in terms of the kind of data points that it collected, like so, uh, like some of the other contact tracing apps, it uses both location as well as Bluetooth for contact tracing. But aside from that, it it, it collects your phone number, your name, your age, your gender, your profession, uh, even some of your health information, whether you're a smoker and your travel history, uh, most of which have very little to do or absolutely nothing to do with how contact tracing is supposed to work. And there were fears from the very beginning about, you know, like we, we've spoken a few times through the course of this conversation about how this app would be normalized. and. I think some of us who, was, who had been studying health tech uh, governance in India were fearful from the beginning that this would eventually become part of, of the sort of larger governance design around healthcare uh, welfare, uh, so to speak, in India. And about sort of two years later, exactly that is what has happened. The, so to begin with, there was no, there was a privacy policy, but it was completely inadequate. After pushback from civil society, the government set up a committee uh, which created a, a kind of protocol. Again, you know, even after the protocol came out, a lot of inadequacies in terms of uh, privacy concerns, discriminatory concerns were raised with it, which never really got addressed. And then about two years later, the protocol was suddenly discontinued and it was announced that this app had now turned into a kind of national health app. So uh, there remains uh, again a lack of clarity in terms of what happened with the data that was uh, collected. Uh, the, I think even before this happened, uh, what people had noticed is that every uh, several people who had registered with the Aroge Setu app health IDs in their names had been created without their knowledge or consent. And uh, even at this point, we don't know. Uh, I mean, there have been RTI applications, there have been news reports, and uh, we've tried to kind of glean what we can by closely studying the privacy policies and what they said about data retention and all of this largely contradicts. So we don't really know uh, what has happened with the data that was collected over the course of two years before this uh, turned from largely a COVID-19 contact tracing app to now a national health app. Uh, even apart from that, I think uh, there's been a lot of issues around uh, some of the other measures, for instance, uh, the platform that was set up uh, for vaccination drive in India. Again, it was very fairly peculiar uh, that in a country like India, which has had uh, a fairly robust, uh, you know, physical healthcare vaccination drive system that has existed for some decades, the the decision to actually move the vac move to what was essentially a digital first, and in some cases a digital only vaccination drive and a lot of uh, it was only after you know the, the government was taken to the court on this that some of the policies around uh, the vaccination drive also changed and allowed for other physical means to register for vaccination so there, there were there have been concerns and what we see emerging now is 
a kind of broader healthcare governance technology infrastructure and uh, there remains a lot of uh, ambiguity around what happens to the data that was collected in what form would it be used uh, who who gets access to that because again most of this has been developed in in this sort of public private partnership model uh, even some of the there's been state endorsement of of certain uh, private party measures around healthcare as well so uh, there remains uh, a lot of uh, questions about who has access to that data to what extent are private actors also getting access to it and in what ways are they allowed to use that so so yeah i think just going back to repeat uh, the earlier point uh, which i think uh, perhaps needs to be repeated over and over again is that when we do have uh, when when you respond uh, with emergency measures i think it it remains even more critical that we continue to apply the standards of necessity and proportionality and data minimization because uh, effect, effectively those measures have uh, inbuilt uh, kind of protections where you can allow for certain degree of restriction on the right to privacy in order to respond uh as long as it is necessary and it can be demonstrated that it is proportional so this this sort of uh urge to do away with those protections in response to any kind of of emergency uh eventually does come back uh to bite us and uh, not to say much of the fact that most of the data and tech measures that we have actually looked at so apart from this you know we've seen sort of untested technology such as uh, thermal scanners uh, being kind of deployed across the world and now they've kind of become part and parcel of uh, being they're being used in schools they're being used in malls uh, in various countries so it it kind of uh, becomes a sort of gateway drug into use of new technologies and and we don't really have a very clear ways of or, or any clear intent to scale them back and i'll pause at that point <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. No, a lot, a lot of important key issues raised there, um, uh, including uh, the anecdotal answer by the Indian government that they didn't know how, who had developed their app. Uh, if they were forced to issue a transparency report, probably they would have had to consider that answer early on. Uh, but then uh, key uh, questions around the regulation, what is going to happen now, and uh, you've mentioned how a whole health, uh, gov health governance ecosystem is now developed. Uh, but then also we, we've seen how that ecosystem then transfers also beyond the health data to border controls and uh, to, to different spaces. Um, and uh, if, um, would, uh, would we like, yes, please. Please introduce yourself as well. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Juan de Brigard. I'm from Colombia as well. Uh, another civil society organization called Carisma. We've worked with the Justicia a couple of times, but funnily enough, we only met with Daniel here for the very first time. Um, and yeah, I was thinking about that last part um, because the, the common trend I start seeing here is uh, with the line of work access now has been developing in our findings regarding um, Medellin Mequida, which was another app for the pandemic specifically for the city of Medellin is that the structural differences that are already there in the communities the the inequalities that are present were exacerbated as happened with so many other things in the during the pandemic and um, I I was thinking about this specifically because the street vendors in Medellin were targeted by by that app in a very specific way. And it, what happened there was there, were, there needed to be an, an um, permit issued by the local government to go around, um, and that had to be done through the app, through Medellin Maquia. And um, of course, if, you, if the permit had to be signed by your employer, which was the case, for street vendors, that <laughs> could not happen, of course. Um, so it impacted them in a very, very uh, specific and different way. And I think it's the same thing with migrants because, uh, well, perhaps not in the, in the pandemic um, data collection scene, but in general in data collection, 
the fact that they're not the the thing we were talking about yesterday the fact that they're not able to um say no to data recollection measures it highlights those structural differences along the the whole use of technology and i think that's quite interesting as a, a leverage point to make people conscious of why this is serious as a broader topic because those things tend to be very hard to to grasp for for people in general and this shows it in a very stingy way i think um and yeah i was yeah just thinking about it thank you <laughs> no thank you very much that's exactly why we're here and it's uh, important to hear uh martin Thanks, Elia. So I'm Martin Mavenge, and I work with the Kenya Human Rights Commission as a senior program advisor for the Transitional Justice Program. And I just wanted to just uh, jump in into the contribution. So with Kenya, uh, part of our, uh, I'll just point out, you know, basically our key findings. Uh, Kenya, just like other states around the world, uh, employed the use of contract tracing uh, to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but from the research, uh, there were two key findings. One, there, were, there was an absence of uh, clear regu regulatory frameworks on, you know, to, to guide on how companies or even how the state could actually use these contract rating apps. But more importantly, uh, there was an absence of an oversight mechanism. So there was, you know, the number of apps that were, uh, were developed by the government, even private actors. But when it came to oversight of how, you know, these apps are used, like just like some of the speakers before me have said, you know, there was an absence of oversight. And we all know in this room, if you don't have oversight over you know specific use of specific applications then it becomes difficult to hold you know uh, the makers of these applications first and foremost to account and even the state to account in the event that they use the application uh, the, the, the data they collect for the wrong uh, for the wrong reason so that's what i wanted to point out thank you no uh, no thank you very much uh, martin this is actually confirming and adding to what we were discussing now but since i have you with us. Uh, and um, as we're moving towards the closing uh, of uh, this session, I, I, I wanted to hear um, your thoughts. We've identified the harms, we have identified the gaps and what uh, states and governments uh, should be doing. Uh, but uh, what could be some of um, the mechanisms civil society could be using to actually put pressure on states to uh, take those necessary measures to ensure we are protected uh, now and in the future. Okay, th thanks, Ilya. Uh, I think the first measure that uh, civil society organizations can employ to ensure that states actually implement uh, some of the recommendations that are in, you know, a number of civil society organizations have, have come up with to report is first, uh, the first thing is to sustain public conversations. When you, ha when you have an informed citizenry or an informed public, then that simply puts pressure on the state. So that's not only, you know, that's, only not, that's, not, uh, that, that, that's a principle that can actually apply in all states around the world. Because if you have an, an empowered citizenry and they know that specific applications that were developed by the different, their different governments are actually harmful, then they will actually pile pressure on, on the state. So the first thing that I would encourage citizens to do is to ensure that the reports with these broad recommendations that we've been able to come up with, because I know it's not only us who have reports, I know Access Now has talked about the research they did and other organizations to ensure that this information is out there to citizens and in you know very simplistic language, because you know, uh, at times civil society organizations like writing you know very bulky reports, so it becomes difficult for the ordinary man outside there to actually understand. So if you have an informed citizenry, then you would pile pressure on the government. Uh, the second approach that civil society organizations can employ uh, is the use of strategic, uh, 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 strategic public interest litigation. Uh, you have all heard from the different speakers here about, you know, the serious, you know, uh, human rights breaches or the serious privacy concerns that uh, some of these apps, you know, that were developed by the states, um, actually, uh, the, the violations that arose as a result of these apps. So, uh, what would I would encourage civil society organizations to do is uh, to institute public interest litigation cases that hopefully will culminate into orders that would compel the state to come, uh, you know, to come up with 
regulatory frameworks or even you know uh, uh, or even that would turn them out to orders that would actually you know recall some of the repressive pieces of legislation that actually enable states to actually conduct serious surveillance or, 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 uh, or privacy or, or data privacy breaches on its citizens. Uh, the other third approach uh, that I think um, the civil society organizations can employ is the use of peer review mechanisms, and there are quite a number. Uh, for the Africa, uh, for, for civil society organizations in Africa, they can always engage with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. That is uh, a peer review mechanism for all the African, uh, Africa, the 54 African member states, whereby they would use this space to actually raise these concerns with the hope that the African Commission would come up with resolutions that they would transmit to these different states and uh, request them to, uh, to, to actually uh, implement some of the recommendations. The other peer review mechanism uh, that is actually essential for all countries around the globe is the universal periodic review system. Uh, so the universal periodic review system began, uh, started way back in 2010. So uh, to date, uh, We've had three cycles uh, for, for all countries around the world. And the reason why the universal periodic review uh, mechanism is very important is because it's a peer-to-peer -peer review mechanism. So different states review different uh, uh, review each other. And at the end of each cycle, there are recommendations that are made for a state. So states are mandated to actually implement some of these recommendations. Uh, and, and some of these recommendations could mean coming up with, you know, uh, policy or regulatory frameworks that can actually, you know, uh, provide, uh, prov ensure that, you know, states actually adhere to best international accepted principles. I will give um, an example of Kenya. In Kenya, we've had, um, Kenya has been reviewed thrice uh, by the Universal Periodic Review Mechanism. And since 2010 to date, I can, um, I can say with confidence that since Kenya started the review process, we've seen you know positive uh, development in terms of legislation because way back in 2010 there were recommendations that were made to the state of Kenya and they were told to come up with you know uh, new pieces of legislation that would conform to the new constitution. Now, fast forward uh, 10 years down the road, we have uh, you know comprehensive pieces of legislation. So I think it's a good it's a good space that we can all uh, we can all benefit from. So what we need to do is to try to think of how we can actually ensure that we make good use of this space. I'll leave it at that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And actually, it's a, it's a very nice segment to finish uh, this discussion in a positive way that, uh, well, positive because there is a lot of venues we can use to work together to pressure for change. Uh, and, well, ne not negative, that there is a lot... <laughs> that there is a lot of uh, work to be done uh, still. Uh, so thank you very much everyone for being here today. As I men we mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are planning to publish the report uh, later, uh, probably by mid-December. And if there is any further uh, input or suggestions or thoughts you, you would like to share with us, uh, we really, really welcome it. And uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and stay tuned uh, for the report's uh, publication. Thank you very much.